resume recording. Any questions about the midterm? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the midterm, looking at the rubric, it looks like you want the report to be numbered lists primarily. So I just want to clarify that you don't want any portion of it to be written like a paper, like an academic paper or something like that. You no, numbered list could be, firstly, this paper shows us this. Secondly, this paper shows us that, you know, something like that. I just want to make sure that you get a few points. It's a rubric. You have some freedom around it. Let, let me open it. Let me open it over here. Let's walk through it together. So your name and full reference and Chicago reference style, you can Google and see what is Chicago reference style. You will have a figure somewhere showing what it is, what the paper is talking about. Four points numbered. When I say numbered, it's, you know, this paper has key four findings. First of all, this paper shows us this, and then you talk about it. Secondly, this paper shows us this, and you talk about it. Instead, if, instead of that, if you just want to make a list with numbers, that's also okay. But the key thing is you should think about what are the four things this paper finds. You might conclude, well, this paper really doesn't have four things. They kind of got away with only one finding. That's probably not true given these papers. There are four, there are many findings. Then again, tools. So it will, it will look like, a, it won't look like an academic paper, first of all, it's only two pages, but these are the things I want you to think about. And uh, you can number it in a list, you can just call it firstly, secondly, thirdly, but you should have this many points. And uh, the seventh point is so you could, I wanna make sure that everyone participates. Now, some of you are abroad, you are not in the same time zones. So setting up Zoom meetings will be a bit tricky and I'm cognizant of that. In groups, if certain student says, I could not participate in any of the meetings because I was in China while the other students were in US, then I totally understand that. But I'm, I'm, you, you can find a common time, you know. Three weeks ago, I gave a seminar in India, which I had to wake up at 3 a.m. and give that one. It was terrible. Then I went back to sleep and came back and taught you all. Last week, it was 7 a.m., which felt like so easy. So I don't think you will have to do 3 a.m. meetings, but uh, just work in a team. And in most of the teams, you will have some conflict regarding which paper to pick. Some of you will have to go for your second choice. Some of you will have to go for your might get your first choice. So this is something you should discuss as a team, which paper to pick. You, don't, you might just decide, guess what? Both of the papers we all picked were kind of not very interesting. Let's go for this other paper altogether. You can do that also. The presentation is five minutes plus minus 30 seconds. You know, so don't go beyond five and a half minutes. Don't make it shorter than four and a half minutes. Anything in that boundary is okay. And it's a PowerPoint presentation. Everyone should contribute. I don't know how, it doesn't have to be one of those videos where people are talking together or anything like that. You can do that if you wish, or only one person can do the talking. It's, it's, it's totally flexible. I'm going to be very liberal in giving grades in this one. I, I cannot be more explicit about this. I would like to give you good points and I would like all of you to get a high grade in this class. This midterm is somewhere where you can get a lot of good points if you participate. So this is what happened last time also. A lot of students actually enjoyed it. I, th I think you will enjoy it. And you will get good points if you enjoy and do the things that I ask for. And I, I have been getting lots of Slack messages, but some of the students troubled about Maxwell's demon and if it really exists and things like that. I'm not gonna tell you too much, you know, I mean, work with your team and try to think through it. Okay, any more questions? And uh, so, okay, cool. If no more questions, I want to start by talking about we will, we will start with phase diagrams today. So mathematically, this course is now past its crux. The math will not get harder. Conceptually, there will be lots and lots of things that will be coming in. So what does that mean? You know, there'll be some new concepts, phase diagrams, this and that. <clears throat> Before we get into phases, I want to point out something very interesting related to second law of thermodynamics. So what does second law of thermodynamics tell us? Second law of thermodynamics tells us that if you drive a process from a system from state A to state B, and you are interested in calculating the free energy difference between these two states, the, let's see how you, I want to write it. 
so that it's consistent with what I have done at the moment. So one of the ways of writing second law of thermodynamics is that when you drive the system from a point A to point B, okay, I'm admitting iPhone guest. I don't know who this person is. Hopefully they will not zoom bomb us. So in this case, the free energy difference between A and B, so delta F, which is equal to FB minus FA is always going to be less than equal to the work done on the system. Does that make sense? You do a certain amount of work on the system to drive it from A to B. And due to this work done on the system, you cause some change in free energy of the system. The change in free energy that the system gets is always going to be less than the work you actually do on the system. Why is that so? Because some of it will be dissipated, right, as heat you are always going to lose some heat to a cold sink or something like that. So this has been the, and this free energy could be Helmholtz energy, Gibbs energy, whatever you're talking about, depends on whether it's constant pressure, temperature or something else. This is the form of second law of thermodynamics, which has existed for 200 years or so, right? This is second law of thermo. And one of the interesting things about this one is it's not an equation, it's an inequality. Right? It tells you that under no condition can delta F be more than W, it will be always less than or equal to W. And uh, the equality happens if the process is quasi-static. If the process is happening so slow that everything is at equilibrium, there is no dissipation, then it becomes inequality. Then it becomes an equality. 20 years ago, the world was really twisted and shocked when someone came and showed that this inequality can actually be converted into an equality. And the relation for that looks like this. It says e to the power, and let me be careful in writing this down here. This is, this is, not, on the, this is not going to be on your exam, but I, I think it, this is, very interesting and it really connects to Maryland. That's why I want to point this to the University of Maryland and to our Department of Chemistry. What was shown around 20 years ago, that instead of looking at delta F, if you look at e to the power minus delta F by kT. So this is a state function, right? This does not depend on the path that you take. This is just a state function that depends on the endpoints. And instead of looking at W, if you look at e to the power minus W over KT, and then you average this thing over all possible paths, reversible, irreversible, whatever you have, all possible paths. This is all paths. And that's what it's hard, it's hard to calculate. But if you do this, this is an equality. This was shown around 1996, and it is called Jarzinski's relation. Some of you might know Chris Jarzinski. He's a professor in our department who occasionally teaches Chem 481. So when he derived this equation in 1996, it was almost as if second law of thermodynamics is wrong, but it is not wrong. What he's showing over here that you can even generalize second law of thermodynamics and it becomes an equality. This is super useful because for example, state A is a protein which is folded and state B is a protein which is unfolded and you want to calculate the free energy difference between both of them. You want to calculate whether the protein is going to look like this. So this is some free energy and this is some folding coordinate or whether the protein is going to look like, like this, you know, which one is more stable, A or B. You can't do anything if you just do this protein pulling experiment and you do work on the system because it is just giving you an inequality. What Chris Jarzinski showed in 1996 that, well, actually this inequality becomes an equality if you're averaging the exponential. So this took the world uh, by shock. And uh, two years ago in the Nobel Prize for Physics, 
last year's Nobel Prize for Physics, if you go and look up the technical citation, it talks about Chris's work in the actual citation as to how this Nobel Prize has made it possible to check this equality in actual experiments. So this is a Maryland connection. I mean, if you ever get a chance to take a class from Chris Jarzinski, you should. He's a wonderful teacher. I think he's a much better teacher than I am, although he sets a good example for people like me on how to teach thermodynamics. So this is I, something I wanted to mention because when you graduate from Maryland and you go and tell someone you studied thermodynamics here, very likely they will tell you, how oh, did you meet Chris Jarzinski? And I hope at least you know why they are so excited about Chris Jarzinski. One of the reasons is because he really, 200 years after and the, the proof for this is not that complicated. We cannot do it in 481. It's, it's, it's more complicated than 481, but it just shocked the world that, that this is possible. Okay, this is not on your exam. This is just to show you that thermodynamics is not dead. Things are still happening. You can still get, he might get the Nobel Prize someday for this. Cool, with that, let's go to things that are more practical and which will very well be on your exams, which is, which are phase diagrams and phases. And we are going to take next four or five classes or even more to study this. One of the puzzles we are going to answer through our studies of phase diagram is something very relevant to winter month, which pertains to ice skating. So I'm sure many of you like, look, uh, like ice skating. Hopefully you are less terrible at ice skating than I am. Does anyone want to tell me how ice skating works? What's the, how, why does it work? Why are you able to skate on ice? Any answers? It melts. Who, who, who answered? I can't see the name, sorry. Uh, Paul. Paul? Or Yes. That is what we think, right? It temporarily melts. Yeah, I watched like a YouTube video on it a while ago. It was more complicated than I remembered. So I'm going to prove to you, I think in the next three classes, that if the melting explanation for ice skating is true, it would require as much, so much pressure, which is the same as an elephant standing on a guitar pick. So it's not true, unless you weigh as much as an elephant and your ice skates are as big as a guitar pick, it's not true. So the melting explanation for ice skating is not true. And I will show you why it's not true. I will not answer in this class as to what is the true explanation. Actually, people have been arguing still as to why really does ice skating work. I will give you some advanced papers, but one of the things you're going to see in the next few classes as to why melting is not a good explanation for ice skating. So that brings us, but yeah, thanks Paul. I'm not saying that you're, well, I, I guess I am saying that you're wrong, but it's not that just you who is wrong. It's, it's like we think it's localized melting, but it's not true. What do I mean by phase diagrams? So phase diagrams are kind of like a map. How do these maps look like? Well, like any map, they are going to have two coordinates. The coordinate could be, One moment. So the it's a map with coordinates. It's it could be a two-dimensional map, it could be a three-dimensional map, it could be a very high dimensional map. Some of the most popular coordinates for a phase diagram are pressure and temperature. You could also have a temperature and composition phase diagram. Those of you who are from material science have probably seen temperature composition phase diagrams. You could have a pressure composition phase diagram. You could have a magnetization composition phase diagram where you're talking about whether a material is magnetic or not, you know. So this over here is magnetization. There can be many, many different forms of phase diagrams. And typically these phase diagrams look like follows. Here I'm going to draw you the phase diagram for water in pressure and temperature land. And we are, and this, this, this is why I brought up the ice skating example because ice skating example really connects to the phase diagram of water. It has a line like this, a line like this, and a line like this. This region, this is the solid phase. 
or ice. This is the liquid phase, and this is the gaseous phase. This point over here is called triple point, and this point over here is the critical point. Water is a really peculiar material where this boundary, so this thing over here is called a phase boundary, while these regions are all phases. So this is the gas phase. This is the solid phase. And uh, this over here is the liquid phase. So you have three phases and you can see boundaries between the phases. Those are called phase boundaries. You can see points at which three phases are meeting. That is a triple point at which at a very particular pressure and temperature, actually water can exist as all three, solid, liquid, and gas. This is a critical point. We are going to talk about this also later. Here, our Van der Waals equation of state will come useful. Funky things happen around the critical point. Water phase diagram is very interesting in the sense that this solid liquid line faces like this for almost chat message is the only is only the top right point a critical point no the other points are not critical only the top right point is a critical point the other points are just phase boundaries so anytime you send a chat message and i don't see it you know just interrupt stop me and ask me i, I love being interrupted so <clears throat> pressure and temperature in the water phase diagram slope downwards. Turns out that for water is the only material for which this is true. For almost everything else, the pressure temperature, the solid liquid phase diagram looks, so here we are talking about the solid liquid phase boundary for water. For almost anything else. Why is water so peculiar? I don't think people quite understand fully as to why is water so peculiar. It's, it boils down to the quantum mechanics of water. Close to zero temperature, water has long range communication between different water molecules. It does funky things. It's, it's still not completely understood as to why does that happen. People think they understand, but it's not very clear. So, and we will be understanding things like this over the next few lectures. So, like I said, the math part of PCAM is, it, you'll still have lots of math. You will have to be handy with your Maxwell relations and things like that. We're not going to pile on more math. However, it gets conceptual. For most people, it should get more interesting because you really start to see uh, thermo in real life. So, this is an example of a phase diagram. The material science students and others might be more familiar with the iron carbon phase diagram, which has lots of complicated features. In, in at least three of the papers, you have different types of phase diagrams that uh, actually, let's open it and see. If we go to the midterm and uh, look at these papers. Mm -hmm. Which one has it? I think Frankel's paper also has a phase diagram. That's a phase diagram. It's a composition composition phase diagram where you can see complicated phases existing. Fluid, A plus F, AB2 plus A. This is a funky phase diagram because it's coming from only hard spheres. Who would have thought that hard spheres would lead to such complicated phase diagrams, right? We think of hard spheres and we think, ah, they're boring, nothing happens. This is why this paper is so fascinating and maybe some of you will go and revisit your decision of which paper to read. This is a fascinating paper because even with hard spheres, you can get such complicated behavior. And uh, the other papers also have phase diagrams in different forms. The ice shelf paper probably has a simple phase diagram, which is solid concentration and temperature phase diagram. These are all examples of phases. This point over here is, I wouldn't call it a critical point. It's, there's some name for it, which I for, forget. I mean, who remembers names? It's, it's, it's a coexistence point where phases coexist, more generally speaking. So, so let's get back to our phase diagrams here. So this is a uh, water phase diagram. So before we go ahead, it's important to understand what a phase is. 
just define it a bit rigorously. So phase, so first of all, I just showed you an example of a phase diagram, which is a map of, what is it a map of? It is a map of thermodynamics, of thermodynamically stable phases. It tells you what form will a given material or a given chemical take, what phase, technically speaking, will a given chemical take at a given pressure, temperature, composition, or whatever is your intensive variable that you're varying. So the thing it's so the thing to keep in mind is that, sorry, that's a wrong use of apostrophe, I think. It's coordinates, it's a map. Any map is given by some coordinates like latitude, longitude, or something else. Its, its coordinates are any intensive variables. You don't see a phase diagram with extensive variables. You see a phase diagram with only intensive variables like pressure, temperature, mole fraction, magnetization, something which is intensive. So what is a phase? We have used the term phase loosely in the past. Now we are going to define it quite rigor rigorously. So I'm going to write it down. A phase is a region of space. By space, I mean physical space, not in some abstract coordinate. In physical space, when you have a material in your hand, a region of space throughout which all properties of a material are uniform. By all properties, what do I mean? I mean density, refraction index, magnetic moment, any physical property that you can think of is uniform. Nothing changes. From the perspective of making a measurement on this material, you cannot tell any difference. Oh, birthday boy is here. You can hang up. Hey, Pakura, you want to say hello? There he is. He's been walking around with his bib, proudly put, showing it off to everyone. Come on, off you go. We are starting phase diagrams. So, so this is a region of space. It's, it's tomorrow, election day. So everything is uniform in that region. If you look at two different points in that material, you have a block of material and everything in this block is same. Any physical property that you can think of. And in this particular block on the right, they are different. So there, here you have a two phase material, for example. And uh, so normally before, before today, you might have thought phase being solid or liquid, but just because something is solid, it doesn't mean it's always in the same phase. Iron is an example. I, iron is one of the most complicated things around. You know? It's the most stable element. So it's everywhere, it's, it dominates the universe but things about it are so complicated. So for iron, for example, at its lowest temperature, at close to zero Kelvin, is, I believe, a face-centered cubic, but as you start increasing the temperature, it changes to another phase where you get a body-centered cubic, and then suddenly magnetization shows up. So the same solid can exist in different phases. What would be the different phases for a solid? It would be crystal structure, it would be magnetization, et cetera, et cetera. Ice, for example, is even more complicated than iron. Ice has at least 15 different phases. Let's see if I can open it, find it on the internet. Ice, and, and uh, people are still trying to find more and more phases of ice. This is a classic one. You see how complicated this is? You have a liquid and these are all the different, this is a, uh, what, what are the coordinates here? I don't know, let's find a better one where the coordinates are not. This is a temperature pressure phase diagram. 
and uh, you have liquid on the top and the part on the bottom is all solid, but you can see the different phases of solid ice marked. Phase number 12, four, six, eight, seven, 13, 14, 15, the 15 one is new. You can see this phase 15 of ice. Vitreous ice, another one? I don't know. I should check, Zach, can you check and post on Slack later? I'm, I'm not so sure, it, it might be, it might be. So this is the 15th phase of ice. I don't think there is a 16th phase yet, but it might happen. And you can see why, and you can see it's kind of esoteric phase, right? It happens only below minus 150 degrees Celsius and at relatively high pressure. Why should one care about such uh, esoteric phase of ice? Any ideas? Why would you care about such a phase of ice? Any thoughts? Maybe like on other planets you can observe that? Precisely. As we go around looking for water in other planets or on asteroids or even further reaches of the galaxy, well, it's going to be in funky temperatures and funky pressures. If you are going to look for water there, it might look in a very different type of ice. So if you knew what form of ice can exist under a certain temperature and pressure, you could do calculations like we do in my lab to get the spectroscopy profile of this particular phase. You know how would its spectra look like? And you have some satellite giving you information from far out in some galaxy. And suddenly you get a spectra, which looks very strange. You can go and tell, wait, this spectra is just like the 14th phase of ice. So maybe they have water. So it's, it's really exciting stuff that people are still trying to find out what's going on. And there is at least one novel by Kurt Vonnegut called Ice Nine. And I forget how much it has to do with ice, but it's called Ice Nine on a particular phase of ice. So this is a phase, it's a region of space through which all properties are uniform. And uh, another thing to keep in mind is I just mentioned ice to you and iron to you as example of phases. The thing about ice and iron, they are both, iron especially is just one element, right? Just Fe. Ice is also just one chemical, H2O. There is nothing else is changing. Maybe you have H3O plus and OH minus existing, which is possible, but otherwise it's just H2O. You could have more than one elements mixed and still have only one phase. You can have more than one elements mixed and still have only one phase. So ice or water is an example of this, right? You have H and O mixed together and yet you have only one phase, for example, liquid water or ice eight or ice one, whatever it is. In metals, does, can anyone think of an example of, or I will just tell you the example is brass which is copper plus zinc, and it can be just one phase. Steel is the most important or practical example, which is used all the time, which is typically iron plus carbon, and you could have just one phase. And of course, as you change the composition of iron or you change the temperature at the same composition, you can get many different phases. One of the hottest materials to study, hottest not in, as in temperature, but from practical importance these days, are these materials called high entropy alloys, So these are example of alloys, right? Not water, but when you have two metals mixed together and you have just one phase or more than one phase. High entropy alloys can often be just in one phase, even though they have at least more than equal to five elements mixed together. So a typical example of a high entropy alloy is when you have cobalt, chromium, iron, manganese, nickel, and throw in a couple more things. You mix it all and you will still have only one phase. It will be uniform everywhere. And these things tend to have wonderful mechanical and semiconductor or whatever, not semiconductor, mechanical or conducting properties. So phases can get complicated, but the thing to keep in mind is, does it look the same in every possible way? That's our definition of a phase which allows us to now talk about phase transition, which is also a term we have used loosely in the past. Phase transition is the change 
from one phase to another at certain pressure or temperature so i'm not i'm not uh, i'm not implying here that a phase transition is something that must happen at the same pressure or at the same temperature typically you talk about phase transitions happening at a certain pressure or at a certain temperature you could generalize it in many different ways and uh, so let's say we have a phase alpha and let's say we have a phase beta these could be two different forms of ice for example and we want to figure out which phase of ice or which of these two phases is going to be stable is going to be the dominant phase so for example we have our pressure temperature phase diagram and i want you to figure out that at this particular point in the phase diagram whether it should be alpha or it should be beta how would i check that curtain pressure no curtain pressure would be bad certain pressure how would i check whether at this point which phase will dominate what should i do which state function should I look at? Gibbs free energy, right? We are talking about pressure and temperature phase diagrams here. In other words, if G alpha is less than G beta, alpha phase will dominate. Or more generally speaking, DG at constant TP less than equal to zero is criteria for spontaneous phase transition. If you have two phases exist, if you have to pick between two particular phases and you want to calculate which phase is going to exist, you calculate their free energy and you see which one has the lower free energy and that is the one that dominates. Let's look at an example of a phase transition. The most famous example of a phase transition, I would say, is one of crystallization. Or more generally, it is called nucleation. When you have a liquid and you have a bunch of water and you put this water in a vessel in the fridge, at some point, the water starts to freeze, right? Typically, the water starts to freeze from the boundaries, right? The ice starts to form, form, form from the boundaries, but it could also form right in the middle. If it forms right in the middle, it is called homogeneous nucleation. So let's study the phase transition related to homogeneous nucleation. So homogeneous nucleation, we are talking about liquid. And at some point, we bring the liquid to some temperature. You did this example in the last homework where you talked about spontaneous change of between liquid and water at five degrees Celsius. And you showed that no liquid should stay there. Sorry, liquid and ice. You showed that ice should not form. It should stay as liquid. So I'm trying to look at that in a more general setup. So I want to study when will a solid form within this, within this liquid. And I'm trying to focus on a box which is big enough. So I don't have to worry about that the nucleation really starts from the boundaries. If you have nucleation happening from the boundaries, it is called heterogeneous nucleation. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm assuming a big enough box where boundaries don't matter. So nucleation happens in the middle. When will this happen? So the theory to deal with this type of phase transition is called classical nucleation theory, which says two things. It says the nucleus of the new phase is spherical with radius r and there is a uniform surface energy cost 
associated with forming this nucleus. Okay? These are the two things classical nucleation theory stays, stays. It goes back to 1930s or even older and it's still quite powerful. Connor is an expert on classical nucleation theory. He can tell you all about it. So now we want to write down the free energy change, the delta G, taking both of these into account. So we have a spherical radius nucleus that is going to form spherical. We have a nucleus which is spherical with radius R. So what is the volume of this nucleus? That is going to be four by three pi R cube. And let's say there is a term A. I'm just going to call it as a symbol A, which is equal to G solid minus G liquid, okay? So if the free energy of the solid is lower than the free energy of the liquid, then, and let's call it per mole, we put a bar symbol over here to make it the molar quantity. Then you multiply it by the volume of the nucleus and this quantity is the free energy benefit, which is how much if G bar solid is less than G bar liquid. But that is not the only thing. As you are nucleating this solid, you are also forming an interface, right? As our honorable president would like to call it, you are building a wall, right? There is a cost related to building a wall. What is the surface area of the wall for a sphere of radius R? that is going to be four pi r square, right? And that will be proportional to the surface energy B. Surface energy cost, I am calling it B. This is going to be positive, almost always. Boundaries cost, it takes cost to put up a wall. There is an interface that is being formed. And this nucleation now is a trade-off between so this over here is the surface energy cost. So nucleation is a trade-off between four by three pi r cube A minus four pi r square B. So if A was positive, if G bar solid is more than G bar liquid, then the free energy of the solid on its own is not favored, right? You don't want to go there. So mostly we are going to be interested in the case where it's opposite, where the solid is, no, I did, uh, the way I should, this is a cost, right? So this should be a plus sign. I'm going to keep this as a plus sign over here. Yeah, okay, now I can be consistent. Let's look at both cases. So case one, G bar solid, more than G bar liquid. Solid really doesn't want to form. In this case, the delta G will be always positive, right? Why? Because this means A is positive. So the first term is positive, the second term is positive, their sum is positive. Never going to form, no way. Case two, when G bar solid is less than G bar liquid, the solid would like to form, but there is a surface energy cost now, right? So. Now our four by three pi r cube a term is negative, but four pi r square is b term is positive. And there is a competition between both of these terms. So in this case, the plot tends to look like this. What is going to happen to delta G at r tends to zero? I'm talking only about case two. Where should it start at r is equal to zero? Where should it be? I'm waiting. Zero. Zero. Good. Who answered? Sungyu. Good. Mm -hmm. I have Sungyu's attention. What happens <laughs> as I increase R? How should it look like? Should it go up? Should it go down? Um, it should go down because 
I think A is related with R cubed and B is related with R squared, R, yeah. Good point, but when R is very small, when R tends to zero, which term dominates, R cubed or R squared? Oh, in that case, R squared. R squared, exactly. Matlab-Skalski is absolutely correct. When it is less than one, or let's say just for, it's, it's a bit complicated than just less than one because there are other numbers, but for very small values of R, it will keep going up because this first term is inconsequential. It doesn't matter, the second term dominates. But at some point, the second term kicks in and it flips. And it starts to look like this. This point over here is called the critical nucleus size. So if you have an ice nucleus that is almost as big as this R star, then it pays to keep growing further. It will solid will grow spontaneously beyond R star. Here, solid nucleus will disappear. So this is a free energy curve, delta G. And keep in mind there is absolute, you might be like, well, what's, what happens at this point where it crosses zero? But this is inconsequential, no one cares about it. Why? Because we could shift the whole point, whole curve by a plus minus, it's just relative, right? It doesn't matter. The most important thing is this inflection. What is the point at which increasing, so beyond R, more than R star, delta G decreases if R is increased. Nucleus grows spontaneously. I like this example a lot because this very much relates to society. People have models of economics or finance where they use this thing. It's, it's called a more general term is called Ostwald ripening, where the idea is that small nucleus tends to disappear and big nucleus tends to grow. This is the, people use this to model wealth, right? When you reach a certain amount of income, it's very easy for you to keep getting richer and richer and richer. When you are lower than a certain amount of income, it's very hard to stay where you are. It's more likely that you will just disappear. Your, all your money will go away. So in other words, this is called rich get richer, poor get poorer. And it really, this is a term which is used in economics, but it's also used in material science and in chemistry. When you make an assembly of particles and almost typically you will see that the big particles tend to keep growing, the bigger grains tend to become bigger and bigger, the smaller grains tend to go smaller and smaller. You can also see it if you have, if you have a glass of beer and you look at the froth on the top of the beer, you will see that the bigger froths or the bigger soap bubbles tend to become bigger, the smaller ones disappear and it all boils down to this one, that this particular plot which we just drew, that if R is less than R star, it is, as per second law of thermodynamics, the direction of spontaneous change is for R to go down. But if R is more than R star, the direction of spontaneous change is for R to go up. It's for it to keep increasing. Now, spontaneous is not the same as instantaneous. There is always a bad, there is typically a barrier associated. In this case, the barrier is this height, height over here. So we can call this as the G dagger. This is the barrier. And at the end of this semester, we will take a lecture or two, lecture or two to talk about kinetics. And that's where this barrier, this curve will come back and we will revisit this curve to think about this. Because so far we haven't talked about time, right? We just say it's spontaneous, it will happen. We have no way of answering so far, when will it happen? How long will we have to wait? So, so 
So let's do, uh, let's recap this. How will our G delta G versus R plot look like if G bar solid is more than G bar liquid? In this case, it will look like this, right? It's always positive. It's A is positive, B is positive. It's a parabola summed up with a cubic term. It's something which will just keep growing. In this case, solid to liquid is the direction of spontaneous change. However, if you have G bar solid less than G bar liquid, then the curve will look something like this, which we just drew, and it goes down to infinity. This is R, this is delta G. In this case, liquid to solid is spontaneous. At some point, everything will become solid and you will have one uniform solid of a very big radius, as big as your sample is. However, this is not instantaneous. And the time will directly relate to how high this barrier is. If you had this curve looking as this, then the process will happen very quickly. If you have this curve looking like this, then the process will happen a bit slower and so, so on and so forth. This we will study in kinetics. So just to drive off the point that spontaneous is not instantaneous. In fact, thermodynamics laws on their own do not tell you anything about time. They just tell you it will happen. When, we don't know. Kinetics comes in, and that's why we have to take a bit of a different perspective in kinetics, which we'll do towards the end of the semester, and try to talk about how does time happen. So this classical nucleation theory, today I used it to just talk about the direction of spontaneous change. Eventually, classical nucleation theory allows us to get the rate constant, and we will do that later. So what did we do today so far? We talked about phase diagrams. We, I introduced you to phase diagrams. I introduced you to the concept of a phase. Next time, I'm going to talk about the concept of a component. Again, something we have been using casually. I will make it rigorous. And then I will talk about the degrees of freedom in a system. This component is denoted by C. Degrees of freedom is denoted by F. And there is a beautiful rule that connects the number of phases that a system can stay in number of phases P, these three are connected through the famous Gibbs phase rule. F is equal to C minus P plus two. This is called Gibbs phase rule. So we are going to work through this. We will see why it's possible. For example, this will help us understand why is the triple point only a point? You can, so this thing that I wrote down, F is equal to C minus P plus two, that we will derive next time. Let's use it. Spontaneous is not equal to instantaneous. Sorry, I did not see that. Yes. Yeah. Here I wrote, spontaneous means it will happen. You know, I mean, my, at the end of the semester, you can say my love for PCAM1 was spontaneous. It doesn't mean you love PCAM1 from the very first lecture. You kind of suffered through it, type two fun. Towards the end of the semester, you are like, ah, oh, I kind of like it, right? It was spontaneous, you reached that point. It wasn't instantaneous. Instantaneous would be like first lecture itself, you were like, wow, I love PCAM1. Hopefully some of you are like that and hopefully all of you will be spontaneous towards the end. So let's look at this water phase diagram. What is the number of components in water if you're not talking about electrostatic H3O plus OH minus? That is one, right? And let's look at this triple point. At this triple point, how many phases do we have? Three. So if we take one minus three plus two, that is equal to zero, or F is equal to zero, or the number of degrees of freedom, the number of ways you can manipulate is zero. And that is why the triple point in water in the pressure temperature phase diagram is a point. You don't have a triple line. For these existence boundaries, you can see C is equal to one, and now you are talking about two phases existing at the same point, solid and gas, so P is equal to two, and if you do C minus P plus two, you get one minus two plus two is equal to one. You have one degree of freedom. So you can vary along a line. So next class, we will talk about our concept of component, and then we will derive this equation for uh, Gibbs phase rule. And in order to do this, we will revisit chemical potential, which we talked about, because chemical potential is directly, 
you can see why, right? Because in the pressure temperature phase diagram, the direction for spontaneous change is dg less than or equal to zero. C is not the boundary, C is the number of components. If this equation is confusing you today, don't worry about it at all. It's, we will be spending a lot of time talking about what is C, what is P in the next class. It, C allows, F allows us to talk about what is this boundary? Is the boundary a line? Is it a point? And we will, we will get to this. So, but we will start again by this equation and talk about chemical potential. I will have office hours today at 11 till 11.45. I have experienced that normally we run out of questions around 11.45, then it's kind of like an awkward Zoom meeting where all of us are just hanging out and like run out of things to ask each other. So I will have it from 11 to 11.45 and I will be available on Slack. New homework will be released Wednesday morning. No TA hours on Tuesday. Connor has a very important PhD exam that he must pass next week. Is that the same as the lecture Zoom link? I think so. Yeah, can, yeah. You go to the, can you go to the last page again real quick? Thank you. Okay, good. I will post this all right away. Yeah. Good. So see some of you in office hour and the, yeah, good luck Connor and Lee. So <laughs> he will do great. You all, when you come to his office hours and you ask him different questions, you are doing, you're helping Connor, okay? So next time when you come to his office hour, ask him lots and lots of different questions. It will make him a better PhD student. Good. See, see you everyone.